Ram Barkai uh, from Tel Aviv University. I will introduce uh, them to you very quickly later on. But let me just say a few words uh, of introduction. Um, the, the reason why we we start this series of conferences dedicated to archaeology and paleontology is, is connected also to one of the missions that the Institute and the Italian Embassy have uh, here uh, in Israel, but in general uh, all over the world. Um, I don't know if you know that uh, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs supports uh, missions in the field of archaeology all over the planet, actually. In specifically in the Mediterranean area, but also in Africa and in South America. Um, and they go in terms of time of chronological extension from the prehistorical times to Middle Ages, so it's a very wide uh, range of, uh, of uh, uh, time. And uh, they are especially concentrated in the Mediterranean area. Among the ones in the Mediterranean, uh, Israel the hosts uh, three uh, missions uh, supported by the Italian, the, 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 by the Republic of Italy. And one of them is the, directed by uh, Professor Lemorini and uh, also coordinated by Professor Barcai. The importance of this mission is of course, connected to the exchange of expertise, exchange, the cultural ex exchange, basically, uh, between the experts, the professors, but also uh, between students. And in the field of uh, archaeology, and especially of um, heritage conservation, which, of course, Italy has a lot, uh, to, to, a long tradition and a lot uh, to share with the rest of the world. So I, I would um, like to thank very much uh, our two guests. Um, I um, will invite you also, if you have questions, uh, to, to raise your hand or to raise your voice uh, in Zoom at the end of their presentation. And I'm going to present them very quickly. Cristina Lemorini is an associate professor at uh, La Sapienza University of Rome, and she teaches experimental archaeology and directs the Laboratory of Technological and Functional Analysis of uh, the Prehistoric artifact, Artifacts. She is also the director of the research mission to the lower Paleolithic sites of Kesem Cave in Israel in cooperation with the University of Tel Aviv and co-financed by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Professor Ran Barkai is teaching at Tel Aviv University and Paleolithic and uh, he, he teaches Paleolithic and directs the laboratory of prehistory. Uh, so Professor Remolini, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, and I'm really pleased to uh, to present to the embassy, to the friend of the embassy, uh, a synthesis of the of the data of our research, a research of, uh, uh, of that is based on a very great collaboration of years between a Sapienza University and me and Tau University, so Professor Rambarkai and also Professor Avi Goffer that uh, is another colleague uh, of the team. So, and, uh, but I want to also um, underline that uh, our collaboration is also a collaboration of uh, teaching to students and now students of PhD students that now are also postgraduate or research assistants. So, and part of the talk of uh, today is uh, uh, related to uh, research and publication the day did uh, with our supervisor, supervisor uh, supervision. So it's, we are very proud also of this uh, collaboration in teaching and uh, make make uh, flourishing new new generation of uh, of researcher. 
so the, the talk uh, is uh, organized in two sections. So the first section, I will speak more in detail on, about the analysis that uh, we teach uh, to our student that I teach of uh, Israeli Italian student and uh, regarding the uh, interaction uh, homo and elephant in uh, late lower Paleolithic Levant. And the second section, uh, will be uh, discussed by Professor Rangvarkai. He will give a, a more general perspective about this uh, really exciting interaction between hominins and the megafauna. Uh, so I'll try to start now, hoping uh, it will be all okay. Um, So, no, so I have some problem as usual. So I don't know how to um, share the, the video. You should open it before and... Uh, yes, you, I, it's open as a button. Share it, it schermo. It ah, okay. Or, or okay, 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 okay. I have it's it's more simple that okay. So here are the PowerPoint. Yes, we see it. Okay, perfect. So I can I can start. Okay. So, um, as I, I told you, so many of the, the data that I will discuss uh, today uh, come from uh, different uh, various uh, publication on a scientific international journal. Here you can, you can see some example and uh, that are the contribution, the strong contribution of our student and the ex students with our supervisor supervision. So, and uh, there is uh, really based on strong collaboration between Sapienza University and uh, Tau University. So we will speak about, uh, uh, I will speak about the toolkit of Homo erectus. So the, the, lead, the artifact, the, the object, the instrument that this Homo uh, used during uh, his, uh, his life, uh, and in our case, in the elephant, in the late World Paleolithic, and in its interaction with the other animals for different type of fauna, and also uh, elephant, the megafauna, or big size elephant now is disappeared, but uh, it was uh, really one of the most important uh, type of fauna that was related with this homo. So the toolkit of the homo, uh, we in general people knows people know very well the B face or end axis uh, that are the uh, certain certain time big side tool with uh, uh, two retouched face, uh, really symmetrical, and uh, they were uh, made of uh, bone, sometimes the bone of elephant, but also from, uh, from uh, flint or other art rock, art rock. but uh, these hominins will use also other type of tools, uh, different type of uh, artifact, but but also uh, flakes and small, small, teeny piece of uh, lithic tools. Pardon? Yeah. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, lithic tools, the small tools that were, uh, that now we know were a very important part of their toolkit. So to give you some example, extra levant in, uh, inside of the late lower Paleolithic, uh, you can find this is an uh, important site in Greece, uh, uh, remains of uh, the uh, elephant skeleton, sometimes quite uh, anterior elephant skeleton, surrounded by this toolkit. In this case, the colleagues 
that excavated the site found only small flakes, no beface, but all around this, uh, this elephant. Another case uh, is another famous case is the site, an Italian site in central Italy, is located of La Paledrara of Cecanibio. In this case, the site was nearby uh, Paleo Alveo, uh, so uh, Paleo River, and uh, the, uh, the um, a lot of uh, fauna remains were found, and many uh, remains of elephant, and just quite until. Uh, skeleton of elephant. This is a really an exceptional finding with, uh, again, around the elephant, small tools that were probably uh, surely used to process uh, this, uh, this animal. So, but uh, we come back uh, to the lithic uh, tools analysis. What do we do uh, with our students, Israeli Italian students, is uh, to detect on the lithic tools, on the surface of the lithic tools, thin, thin microscopic traces that are uh, related to the uh, contact of the lithic tools with the material used. That these are user, and we can detect also not only user but also residues, the uh, residues of the material that was worked with, with these tools. So, with our methodology, we can understand uh, uh, for what they were used. This these tools. So, in in here, I, I show you some of the of the equipment that we use in Sapienza and in Tau University to analyze these uh, lithic tools and to see the traces, uh, the modification, the micro modification of the edge of these tools for use and the residues of the material work. And also if there is residues of very, very ancient times, but we can find in, uh, in in, we can find that this uh, this remain, and, and I show you that we found also in uh, in uh, the wonderful Revadim site that uh, I show you soon. So another important uh, aspect of our methodolo methodology is. Uh, the experiment that we have to do. So we have to create a reference collection of a replica of lithic tools similar to the tools used from Bio Homo erectus. And we have to replicate the possible uh, activities that this hominins made. So in this case, you see, we have a lot of experiments that our students made that are related to butchering, because it, this was one of the main activities made by these hominins. So butchering, take off meat, breaking bones to take off marrow, that was a, a, a material very precious for the for as rich energetic food that it was really, really important for these hominins. But we made also many other experiments related to processing also plants, uh, tubers. But uh, this is to underline what the importance of the experimentation and the, um, create, the creating of a reference collection to compare with the user and residues of the archaeological tools. So, in summarizing, user analysis and residual analysis are source of essential data for the comprehension of hominins behavior and also of the comprehension of the hominins behavior related to megafauna, related to elephants. So now we can start to speak uh, uh, about the one of the site of uh, the uh, Israeli site related to late lower Paleolithic, this is the site of Rebadim. Professor Rabarkai is the director of the scientific research regarding the lithic tools found in Rebadim. And this is uh, one of the most important sites in Israel uh, related to late lower Paleolithic. 
it was, uh, um, it was an excavation made some years ago, a rescue excavation. Uh, the site was uh, located near Tel Aviv. And the site uh, offered a lot, a lot, a lot of remains uh, of uh, fauna, so megafauna, megafauna elephant, a lot of uh, lithic industries, uh, bee face, flakes, uh, uh, chopping tools, uh, scrapers. So very a huge quantity of remains. You can see here ribs of uh, elephant and uh, surrounded by different type of lithic tools. So this is uh, the site that I'm going to uh, discuss uh, regarding the toolkit of these hominins. So what we found uh, uh, in uh, sorry so at oh, sorry okay so the first uh, uh, type of uh, of tools that uh, we will discuss are B face or end axis sorry i don't understand why okay so in revadim uh, a lot of B-face and axes were found, and uh, in this case, uh, our study allowed to understand for what type of activities they were used for. So uh, I have an example of this B-face that was used on this edge. These are the user of uh, related to the cutting of soft material, animal soft material. This is the chemical analysis that, um, that uh, show that uh, the, in, on this phase there were residues of, of uh, um, a sort of uh, um, alteration of fat animal residues. So for sure, beef, this beef phase was used for butchering, maybe also butchering megafauna. And on other beef phase from Rivadim, uh, traces of cutting uh, soft and medium material were, was found. So that means that these beef phase were not used for heavy duty activities, but just for activities of cutting, probably a uh, big mass of material and probably also big mass of uh, uh, meat related to butchering various type of carcass. Another type, a very special, important type of tool of uh, lithic tools from Revadim are small tools. So here you have some some example of these very small, thin tools. So and the uh, also on these small tools were found many uh, uh, user and residues related to butchering activity. They were used for sure also for other material, but butchering activity is one of the most important activities related to these small tools. And the experiment showed us that these small tools, of course, they cannot be used to uh, process, to exploit big mass of, of material, of, of meat, but they can be used for really precise activities. So activities very precise to, as a sort of razoring, uh, to cut uh, the or take of meat, probably um, um, some, from uh, narrow interstices of the carcass. So in this case, we, we can, already understand that these omens had different, quite specialized tools for different sections of their butchering or their processing of animals. Another uh, really also exciting uh, study, really recent studies of um, uh, of Venditti, Rambarkai, uh, Flavio Venditti was one of our um, one of our brilliant students. So she published this uh, wonderful work about uh, this uh, type of tools, uh, are chopping tools, uh, are tools uh, of um, they have some they have uh, uh, sort of uh, edge pointed edge that was uh, used uh, following uh, the research of Flavia 
for sure for uh, uh, butchering. So here you can see various type of residues, animal residues that were found on these tools. And but they were not used really to cut, but uh, they were used to um, in a sort of percussion against the, the meat, but also against bone. So the idea, the interpretation of, um, of Flavia, the interpretation related to the user analysis, residues analysis and her experiment is that these tools were again a special toolkit that was used to scrape off to clean bone it to create the first line for the breakage of these bones the breakage of these bones this was done with more strong tools but to of course exploit the marrow of of the of the animals. So uh, summarizing, uh, it's clear that, that a revadim, these hominins had a different type of tools, a different type quite of specialized tools to process the especially animal material to butchering the carcass. Uh, so in different parts of the carcass, but probably also in different moment of uh, exploitation of the carcass. So uh, here I, I, I've made a sort of slide that uh, I made a slide to to show how the uh, possibility of this hominin to have a very strong but also precise grip with their hand uh, give them the possibility to manipulate different type of um, tools, big, small, for heavy but also precise activities for successfully process. Uh, different type of uh, material and especially to have the possibility to uh, re to um, to to have to exploit um, a variety of food animal uh, vegetal food but especially animal food was a very very important resource that because it's really energetic and it means that uh, they could uh, uh, give a good, uh, strong energy to their cognitive uh, um, process. Uh, so the, 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 the evolution of the hominins uh, is, can be synthesized on this circle of, uh, of, uh, of possibilities of exploitation of, uh, of of, of the, the landscape, uh, of, the, of the food, of the animal, of the plant, to, um, to have uh, uh, energies to, uh, to uh, develop also in a cognitive point of view their, uh, their um, humanity in this case. So I think that I, I finished my part of the presentation. I, I'm, I have the pleasure to, to give the, uh, so, la parola to my, to my friend, Arana. Thank you, Christina. If you can stop sharing, so I'll yes. share the presentation so I can control the slides. Okay. 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 Can you see the slide? It's okay. Yes. Great. Okay. So thank you, thank you, Christina. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here and talk to you. And it's a good opportunity to thank uh, the Italian Republic and Christina as a representative of the Italian Republic for a fruitful collaboration for uh, many, many years. As Christina mentioned, uh, we, we are working together for quite a while. 
uh, mostly together with uh, with mutual students from uh, from Tel Aviv and Rome, and uh, with great success. And and throughout the years, we were able to 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 publish a set of very significant papers and enlarge very much the knowledge about prehistory, about human behavior, about human activities, and so on. Uh, so this combination, this uh, this collaboration of Tel Aviv and Rome uh, is 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 really successful. Is really significant. We are very good friends. We visit each other quite often when it's possible. And surely, when the pandemic is over, we will see each other because we have mutual PhD students and postdocs and so on. And some of our students even became researchers by themselves, which is really a pleasure. And this and this collaboration also enables to uh, uh, combine between the beautiful archaeology which exists in, in Israel in, in very good preservation with the scientific with the scientific uh, uh, abilities of our colleagues in Italy and this brings together a very good team with very good results so I thank Christina and I thank uh, Italy for this it's a it's a real pleasure for many years, and we're able to make very good con scientific contribution, which is a pleasure and and a duty. So, after this short uh, thank you words, uh, I will present a more general view of aspects that that Christina dealt with. Uh, we are dealing mostly with, with very specific details, but I will try to present the big picture following the details. We are studying the details in order to get, get an understanding of the general picture, and, and the details are studied together with, with Christina and our students, and then we try to develop the big picture, but in order to be able to do that, we need to know what was, what was going on. As Christina mentioned, we need to know what tools they were making, how they use the tools, how effective the tools are for the different stages and so on. So after doing all this basic research, we are trying to, again, get grips with the bigger picture. And I will talk about the bigger picture, mostly about human relationships with elephants and mammoths and this is a picture which would which which which, which would demonstrate uh, uh, mostly what kind of interactions were there there's no easy words saying that uh, people were eating elephants elephants and mammoths throughout hundreds of thousands of years and we claim that people were dependent on elephants and mammoths in order to to sustain themselves and in order to do that they developed a set of tools that we are studying. And I will try to, to convince you that people in the past, our ancestors, were not only eating elephants, they were having relationships with elephants. They respected elephants. Again, you don't have to, to, to take what we say is 100% truth. We are, we are, uh, we're, we're, we're doing, doing archeology span and we try to provide an, ed an educated guest guess for what went on half a million ago half a, half a million years ago it's not easy but we do our best so the so the take home message in a nutshell of my part would be that past and present hunter gatherers were dependent on fat and meat for their adaptation and well-being as early as two million years ago and ever since until the advent of agri of of agriculture Past and present hunter-gatherers view the world as composed of other than human persons and entities. Past and present hunter-gatherers hunted animal persons for meat, but mostly for, for fat, and wasted nothing of the hunted animal. Humans shared habitats with elephants and mammoths for two million years and had special relationships with proboscideans. These are the main points I would like to touch upon. And elephants and mammoths have extraordinary fat deposits and thus were preferred animal person prey whenever available. Because I guess you're wondering why people were concentrating on elephants and mammoths. And I will talk about that a bit. As we go on, I need to present some basic 
premises. And these are these are our premises. Some people argue otherwise, and this is good to to debate in science. Otherwise, we won't proceed. So, in our opinion, Paleolithic people, starting two million years ago, experienced high energetic demands in terms of caloric intake. They were not sitting in front of Zoom all day. They were hanging around. So they needed between 3,000 to 5,000 calories a day. Uh, the Paleolithic diet, as we see it, was based on the consumption of fat and protein supplemented by vegetal resources. Of course, they ate vegetal resources, but they ate mostly meat and fat. And we can talk about that later in detail, if you like. We have to take into account that humans are limited by their physical ability to extract calories from protein. Humans cannot eat meat as much as they like or they would like. Natural vegetal food, especially without the use of fire, is unlikely to be sufficient to provide this calorie intake. And fat can be consumed unlimitedly. Fat is the densest energy source in nature. It provides nine calories per gram at a minimal digestion cost, while meat and carbohydrates provide only four calories per gram. So fat provides as double as much calories than any other food source. Mega herbivores, and especially elephants, provide the unique combination of fat and meat, as well as extraordinary fat quantities and qualities. So it is all about fat. Throughout the Paleolithic period, elephants and mammoth remains are found at many archaeological sites in the old and new worlds, and especially in Israel and Italy. We'll see that in a minute. Uh, so this kind of, uh, of joint interest was not, is not only at the present, it was also in the past. Uh, it is evident that early humans consumed proboscideans, fat and meat for hundreds of, of thousands of years. And last point, and an important one, is that elephant and mammoth played not only a nutritional role in the Paleolithic, but also served as cosmological and symbolic elements. It's a combination of culture and nutrition. So humans were sharing habitats with a lot of animals, but especially with elephants and mammoths. And people had, people in the past consumed a lot of animals, they, many animal taxa, but they preferred elephants and mammoths. And this is what we talk about. We talk about our direct ancestor, which is called mostly, as you see here, by the name of Homo erectus. This is a human being that evolved in Africa two million years ago, and he's the ancestor of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. So he is our direct ancestor. We are very much alike Homo erectus. We, we, we are very similar to, to Homo erectus, and, and it's a stage before Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. And, and of course, we are dealing with very ancient time periods. Homo erectus had a large brain, a reduced digestive system. Uh, he probably used fire, as we know. Uh, he had specific stone tools, as Christina mentioned. And as I mentioned, his diet was mostly based on animal, on animal resources. And many scholars believe now that Homo erectus had hunting capabilities starting two, mi starting two million years ago. So early humans, our ancestors, hunted animals as early as two million years ago. And this is quite common knowledge nowadays. Uh, something happened to my presentation. I'm sorry, I probably pushed something. Well, I'll do it again, sorry. Okay, my mistake, we're back, right? Okay, so humans were dependent on fat and meat, as I said before, chimpanzees eat meat as well. So even the common ancestor of early humans were eating meat. So this is, a new, this is not a new thing in human evolution. As I mentioned before, many, many Paleolithic sites have elephant remains. Christina mentioned the site of Revadim that you can see here with the elephant rib and other elephant remains. 
This is the site Christina also mentioned, La Poledrara in Italy. This is another beautiful site in Italy, Castel de Guido, with elephant remains. So Israel and Italy, half a million years ago, shared many similarities as well. People were making similar tools and hunting the same animals in Israel and Italy half a million years ago. And this brings Christina and me and our students also together because it's a, it's, it's a great feeling to, to understand and realize that what we are doing is mutual to Israel and Italy, many other places, but there are amazing concentrations of Paleolithic sites with elephants, especially in Israel and in Italy. I could not explain that, but this is a, a, a good chance for us to do, to do work together on sites which are in Israel and Italy. And as we mentioned earlier, there are, there, are, there are many sites like that all over the old and new worlds. Whenever people came across elephants, it's the same picture. But again, half a million years ago, in Italy and Israel, there were major concentrations of sites with Homo erectus and elephants, which is great for us. So why elephants? People were not uh, very picky at the Paleolithic. They were eating what was out there. And out there were many animal taxa, but one very significant animal taxa, which is elephants and mammoths. Elephants and mammoths are the largest terrestrial animal. As Christina mentioned, they were at least as double in size as modern elephants. They weighed, they weighed around 10 tons each. Elephants and mammoths have extra high caloric fat content. Half of the calories within an elephant or a mammoth is in the fat. And these are millions of, of, of calories. And uh, elephants and mammoths have higher retention of body fat throughout the year. They don't lose much fat. So even in lean season, they have much fat. And animals and mammoths were around throughout hundreds of thousands of years. So as we see, the question is not why they consumed uh, uh, elephant. It should be, if they wouldn't have consumed, this would be the question. This is the, the best choice in the past. But as we mentioned earlier, elephants and mammoths appear not only as dinner on the table, but also in what is called Paleolithic art. In many caves in Western Europe, Mammoths are depicted on the walls of the caves. Uh, mammoth ivory is used in order to make all kinds of statues of elephants and elephant and mammoth ivory is used to make all kinds of, of artwork. And people were depicting mammoths and other animals, but mostly mammoths inside caves. So we believe that they also had a, a very deep, a very deep symbolic meanings for these people, maybe because of their, of their, of the nutritional value. Another interesting aspect that we study and we still mentioned is uh, the most common tools of Homo erectus is called a uh, handex or a biface. These are large stone tools that were made by Homo erectus for two million years all over the old world. Whenever Homo erectus reached, he made the same tools, the same handexes and the same, the same small flakes. As Christina mentioned, handexes were made, were used mostly in order to slice meat. Uh, and they are very uh, effective for that. An amazing thing is that at some sites, and strangely enough, mostly in sites in Israel and Italy, Homo erectus half a million years ago were making replicas of the flint stone, stone indexes of elephant bones. They were smashing elephant limb bones in order to extract the marrow, but they took broken elephant limb bones and made replicas of the stone tools using the elephant bone. And we suggest that these are not functional items, but these are symbolic items. And, this, and these replicas of the indexes present a kind of a cosmological circle. And I will, uh, I will talk a little bit about that. Again, you don't have to accept it. This is uh, our view, at least my view. I don't know even if Christina fully agrees 
with my crazy ideas, but we'll try. So we suggest, and we publish that in several places, that the intimate physical contact between the hunters and the item made from the hunted animal provided humans with the perspective of the animal, or most significantly, we suggest that butchered elephant bones were, were, pers were purposely selected in order to allow early humans to become elephant, to transform into elephants and experience the elephant perspective and abilities. The elephant bone index might also have constitute as a token of appreciation and respect towards elephants. This is what we suggest because in many indigenous societies, this, there is this, this complex relationships between the hunter and the hunted, and there's a lot of respect towards the hunted animals, and we suggest that this took place also in Israel and Italy half a million years ago. But again, this is under debate, and not all of our, of our, of our colleagues agree, but everyone agrees that these bone indexes were most probably not practical tools. There's something special about elephants. Uh, even today, people are very attached to, to uh, uh, elephants, and we suggest that this goes way, way back in the history of humanity. Moreover, uh, humans and elephants share a lot of similarities. There are physical similarities between humans and elephants. Even the human brain and the elephant brains look very much uh, uh, alike. There are behavioral and social similarities between humans and elephants. I guess you are familiar with, with many of these. Elephants take care of each other, they educate their, their youngs, they take care of them, they transmit knowledge, they pay respect to dead elephants, and so on. And they even have cognitive and conceptual similarities with humans. So as researchers today observe elephants and recognize the similarities between humans and elephants, we are sure that people in the past did the same. They observed elephants and they acknowledged the, the similarities between human and elephants. And in many hunter-gatherers groups today, elephants are conceived as people and people are conceived as elephants. They don't see any difference between elephants and humans. So it's not only about nutrition, it's not only about respect, it is also about similarities between elephants and humans, and again, similarities that we believe that people in the past were aware of. So just to end, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words. Uh, as far as, see, as we see it, humans shared the world with animals and had special relationships and interactions with elephants and mammoths as Procedians were viewed at the same time as other than human persons, as well as an essential and significant source of calories. This statement is true for all animal species humans were, were dependent uh, uh, upon, but especially about elephants. Humans were dependent on calories extracted from elephants and mammoths for the successful uh, adaptation. Elephants and mounts provided a unique food package with a special composition of fat. Other animal taxa have other specific qualities and thus humans have, sp have special relationships uh, with any major animal prey. But today we talk about, about elephants and again all these insights are gained by, by our basic research of, of the stone tools and the animal bones as Christina mentioned. Just to end up, uh, we suggest that human have had their way in the world, hunting and respecting. Humans were repeatedly preoccupied by the procurement, exploitation, and appreciation of elephants and other large herbivores. Thank you very much. And I will end here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Barkay, and thank you, Professor Lemorini for your very interesting presentations. And then now we have some time for uh, questions uh, for uh, someone, if, you, if someone wants to take the floor and say uh, something, uh, you are free to do it, please do it. Um, if not, I'm, I, oh, there is, Marcelo, please unmute yourself.
Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Um, I enjoyed it very much. I have a few questions uh, concerning your findings. It seems like the gathering hunters were not responsible with their tools because they left them all around the animal where they're waiting. And they, uh, we assume they are not leaving the, the, the remains that you find uh, many, many tools. Is, uh, we, we may expect that they have been collecting them after they finish eating because there was no settlement at that time. That's one, one question. The second one, if you find the uh, marks of fire around the skeletons of the elephants, if they were still available, or you, you find any. Um, but uh, concerning the hypothesis that they were eating, mainly looking on elephants for the fat, uh, we may assume that there also were other animals that were also fatty animals. We can say hippopotamus, we can say some uh, other, other mammals that may also have a, a, a quantity, high relative uh, quantum of, of meat, of fat, but they are less risky for being hunted. So rant, hunt, uh, hunting an, an, a mammoth or an elephant is a very risky operation, much riskier than, than, than hunting other animals. So the assumption of the, they were just targeting uh, elephants as a daily, or say a daily activity, something that sounds at the beginning a little uh, surprising that, uh, that, uh, that we, we have learned in the past at least that uh, the eating uh, such a big animal must be, have been a really rare event and not an unusual event. Can you clarify on this, please? Christina, would you like to, to uh, say something or? Uh, uh, just uh, just for about the deletics. After that, I can I, I leave you answer uh, all the other questions. Just, let, just one second. Let me just say that uh, there was also another question. So Rosella, I note, noted your your decide to participate. So I will leave you the floor later. Please, please, Christina. Okay. Uh, no, it's you're right that uh, uh, so they they left. Uh, tools around the uh, the so in, in the site but uh, i mean the more detailed picture can show when we analyze uh, the technology of the tools and maybe the refitting of the tools that in fact they didn't leave all the the toolkit on the site some of these toolkit were were uh, was left other were they, uh, they took with them because we can see that some of the uh, production sequence of the, these tools uh, is not on the site. And uh, maybe they introduce in the site the tools that were napped in another site and they left them after the use. And uh, uh, vice versa, for example, at La Poledrara, we have an example of uh, knapping on. Uh, near the elephant and leaving there some tool also not used and they took with them other tools and leaving the place so it's a more complex picture what i can uh, i can say also as my experience with these hominids and their tools that uh, is not unusual that they can leave on the site tools that are not completely exploited. They could be used for other times, for many times, but they left in any case. Why, I don't know. Maybe we have a different perspective now on how to exploit a tool. But this is the, what I, I observed on, on, on this site. So that's, this, is, this is all, and I, I leave the, the uh, so to, to run the, the uh, so the, he can answer for. The more, uh, the more difficult questions you leave to me. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I leave, uh, it's for you. Uh, uh, for us, I mean, we do, we're in this together. <laughs> But, but uh, well, I'm not sure I remember all the questions, so I'll try to, to, uh, to react, and you're welcome, Marcelo, to, to, uh, uh, to remind me of some questions. So I'll start from the end, from the last question. Uh, we never said that they hunted elephants on a daily basis. 
not at all, not at all. We don't know how often uh, elephants were hunted. We believe elephants were hunted rarely. Maybe if we say once a year or once half a year, not more often than that. If you want an example, we believe it is very similar like, like groups in the Arctic nowadays are hunting an elephant, a, a, a whale, a single whale before winter. And this whale sustained them for the whole winter. So we believe that an, that an elephant sustained the group for months. There are evidence for indigenous groups in Africa who hunt an elephant, one elephant, and they sustain on this elephant for nine months. They can preserve the meat and preserve the fat. So we don't say that they hunted an hunted elephant on a daily basis. On the contrary, we suggest that this was rare, maybe a very, very special occasion, uh, once a year, once half a year, and so on. So this is about the, 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 the schedule of, of elephant hunting. Second, I never hunted the elephant myself, luckily for me and for the elephant. So I cannot provide uh, direct evidence for how it works. But I have good colleagues that are working in the Congo Basin in Africa with group of pygmies that are still hunting elephant for meat and fat at fat consumption. And these are small individuals and a single pygmy is able to hunt an elephant by himself We're using a spear. It is true that this is done in the forest and not in the, in the savanna, but these are very capable humans. And we believe that early humans were at least as capable as them. We believe that people knew everything about the way of life of these animals. They knew their weak spots and they, and they, and they knew how to hunt them. And people that, that, are, that are specialized in, in, in hunting protein, in hunting practices say that hippo hunting is much more dangerous than elephant hunting. Hippos are much more dangerous and rhinos are much more dangerous and much more difficult to be hunted. Another point is that we have archaeological evidence to show again that there were special relationships between human and elephants, not only because of the similarities between human and elephants, but there are strong arguments that people, ancient people in the past were using migrating routes of elephants in order to travel out of Africa. There are evidence that people were moving with the elephants, together with the elephants. The elephants paved the way for humans because elephants are highly dependent on water. They need hundreds of liters of water a day and they have a very good memory. So they are, they are path of elephants, even today in the forest, People that live in the forest, they follow the elephants. So we believe that this mutual connection also has a meaning why elephants were, were chosen. Uh, so this is for, for that question. There, there are archaeological evidence for the use of wooden spears at least as 400,000 years ago. So we believe that elephants were hunted using spears and again, from the evidence, from the experience of modern hunters in the Congo Basin, uh, uh, it, was, it, it was demonstrated that wooden spears could be used in order to hunt an elephant if you know how to do it. It is highly dangerous, no doubt, but the profit is very large. And again, it's a, it's a complicated story. Uh, as for the, the, the huge amount of stone tools, this is true. And, and, and uh, um, again, we're talking about half a million years ago and we don't have a time machine yet. I hope that we'll never have a time, have a time machine. So we're not able to understand everything. Uh, uh, but we know first, uh, not as you said, we know that the site of Revadim was visited recurrently by human groups. People were coming to the site again and again and for we don't know how long or how many times but we can say that for very long and many many times uh, i give you an example the site of kesem cave that we are working on christina was mentioned it's a specific cave near near tel aviv which people were using for two hundred thousand years people kept coming again and again for two hundred thousand years 
this is a site without elephant remains, so, so we didn't talk about that. This is a site after elephant became extinct, but it's an example that people came over and over and over and over again. Why they were making so many stone tools, why they could use some of the already existing stone tools, it's a good question, but we know that they also used some of the existing stone tools. For the last maybe 20 years, we present over and over again evidence for what we call recycling. People also re recycled tools of their ancestors. Why so many tools were left, it's a good question. And we don't have a good answer, but this is a typical thing for, for the Paleolithic. So for some questions, we still have to, have to think further. But thank you for the questions. And if I missed anything, Remind me. Okay, there was. Hi, I think. Ah, uh, sorry. There was also uh, Rosella Terhatin who wanted to participate with a question. Rosella, you need to unmute yourself. No? Okay, maybe I can. Un All right. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I was wondering if you could say a little more about uh, which species of elephants lived uh, in the area of modern Israel and when they became extinct. You said that they were about double the size of modern elephants, but I was wondering if you can tell a little more about that and about uh, which kind of uh, mammoths lived here. Thank you. Well, I'll answer Christina, I'll try. I'm not, I'm not a specialist in uh, zoology. We have other specialists. Uh, uh, prehistoric archaeology is a, is, a, is, a, is a team effort, is a multidisciplinary work. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm mostly working on the lithics. Christina is working on the functional aspects of the lithic. And we have colleagues from, from zoology work on the animal remains. But I can try. Mm -hmm. uh, the elephants that lived not only in Israel, but in Italy, it's the same elephant. Mm -hmm. It is called straight tusk elephant. It's an elephant with straight, huge tusks. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, a male adult elephant, a straight tusk elephant, Paleoloxodon uh, anticus, it is called. The Latin name is Paleoloxodon uh, anticus. A male adult elephant weighed up to 13 tons. 13, one, three tons. They were huge. Uh, there were other kinds of mammoths here, but mostly, mostly straight tusk elephants. And again, here in Italy, it's the same species of elephant. Uh, its origin is from Africa, of course. And we have evidence in Israel of this straight tusk elephant from at least almost 2 million years ago, the site of uh, Ubadia in the Jordan Valley has elephant remains. And following what we know, elephants disappeared from the Levant around 400,000 years ago, at least mm -hmm. in archeological sites, which are later than 400,000 years ago, we don't find elephant remains at all. And until very, very late, I mean, so, and, and we don't know why. I mean, it is possible, hypothetically, that elephants were around, but, but, but people were not hunting them or consuming them, but this makes no sense. So we believe that for some reason, we don't know the reason, elephants disappeared from the Levant around 400,000 years ago, but elephants were reintroduced to the Levant in the Bronze Age. In the Bronze Age, about 5,000 years ago, Elephants are found again in Israel, in Syria, but not uh, African elephants, Asian elephants that were brought by ships in order to be presented in palaces and so on. So elephants were reintroduced by humans hundreds of thousands of years until they, uh, uh, after they, they became extinct. There Thank is, you. There are Thank you very of, much. There are stories of Egyptian pharaohs that conquered Israel and Syria and met elephants in, in the rivers. But again, these were elephants that were later introduced. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Okay. If there are no more questions, I would like to to remind you that this uh, meeting uh, will be soon posted in uh, our YouTube uh, page and the page uh, of the Institute. So uh, you can share it with, the, with you know, whoever uh, wanted to be present and couldn't make it tonight. And I'd like to thank very much again, Professor Cristina Lemorini and Professor Ran Barkay for being with us tonight and for their very interesting presentation. And of course, thank you all very much for being with us. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. See you in Tel Aviv. I hope. Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Thank you.